Chapter 6 A Man in His Room By the time the caissons were finished, Washington Roebling was a wreck. This first stage of the project had taken more than two years. He had worked 12 hours or more, six days a week. He had gone down to the caissons and come back up hundreds of times. He knew every detail about the bridge and was in charge of it all, but all the work and the number of tragedies was ruining his health. In the spring of 1872, Washington got the bends again and collapsed. This time, the pain was so terrible, he had to stay in bed for days. The doctors thought he would die. In the following months, his health got worse. Worse. Finally, Washington was too sick to leave his house. He could barely speak or eat. Emily sometimes had to feed him. He had terrible headaches. Some days he couldn't see well. Was he going blind? He couldn't write either. His handwriting was a messy scrawl. He felt too nervous to meet with his assistants. He didn't want to talk to anyone. The truth was, Washington Roebling was having a nervous breakdown. The stress of building the bridge was ruining his health. Little by little, Emily began to take over speaking and writing for her husband. Whenever the bridge workers needed to know what to do next, they would ask Emily. She would talk to Washington and then give them an answer. She wrote all her husband's letters for him, putting down exactly what he wanted to say. Meanwhile, Washington sat near a window in his house in Brooklyn. His house faced the river. With a pair of binoculars, he was able to watch construction of the bridge. He also had a telescope mounted by the window. He saw everything that went on. His mind was sharp, even though his spirit and body were broken. He just didn't want to see other people or talk to them. Maybe not ever again. As for the towers, it took five years to build them. It was slow work and sometimes dangerous, but it wasn't very hard. So for six months, Washington and Emily went on a trip to Europe. Perhaps a vacation would make him feel better. It didn't. Finally, they moved back into his father's house in Trenton, New Jersey. From there, Washington wrote letters to the men who were working on the bridge. He was still the chief engineer. Washington and Emily stayed in New Jersey for nearly three years until the two bridge towers were built. Then they moved to New York, then back to Brooklyn. He still didn't want to go out of the house or see people, but he wanted to be nearby. He still loved his job. Over time, all the men on the bridge job came to respect Emily Roebling. They treated her as an equal. That was very unusual then. The workers at the bridge didn't mind when Emily came to check and make sure a job was being done correctly. Once, a bridge engineer came to Washington's house with a problem. Instead of discussing it with her husband, Emily sat down with the engineer herself. She did a small drawing to show him how to solve the problem. People began to think Emily was the real brains behind the bridge. She certainly was brilliant, but her husband was still very much in charge. He kept every single detail about the bridge in his head. He still made all the plans and drawings. Finally, it was time to start putting the wire cables in place. That was going to be a very tricky, very important part of the job. Washington was looking forward to it. He knew more about wire than almost anything anyone else. He and his father had always thought their company would make the wire for the bridge. Unfortunately, other men had different ideas about who should make the wire and who should make a lot of money from it too.